So let's now talk about the dosing of Augmentin. So it's available both as an oral tablet form and as an intravenous preparation. So let's begin with the oral dosing. So the tablets contain 625 milligrams. So the oral dose is 625 milligrams three times a day, which is what TDS means for however many days you want the patient to have it. So it might be for five days or seven days or 10 days or two weeks. So 625 milligrams is a single tablet. And in that tablet, 500 milligrams is amoxicillin and 125 milligrams is the clavulonic acid. Now let's have a look at the intravenous dose. So the intravenous dose is larger, so it's 1.2 grams, so 1,200 milligrams. Again, it's three times a day, but it's now an intravenous injection. And in that intravenous injection, 1,000 milligrams will be amoxicillin and 200 milligrams will be the clavulonic acid. So being given three times a day means that maybe a dose will be in, in the morning, maybe at 8 a.m., and then a dose uh, mid-afternoon, maybe about 2 o'clock, and then another dose before bed, maybe around 10 p.m. usually. That would uh, be reasonable. You don't need to space it exactly eight hours apart, as long as it's roughly three times a day. Now, you have to be more careful with this drug in patients with renal failure. In particular, it's the clavulonic acid that you have to be careful with. So the doses do actually reduce in people with bad kidney function. The oral dose doesn't reduce. You can still give this same dose in people with really bad kidney function. However, the intravenous dose we do reduce. So when the EGFR is less than 30, so for those who don't know, uh, there might be some members of the wider public watching this video, EGFR stands for Estimated Glomerular Filtration Rate. And what it basically is, is it's a number that we calculate using a complicated formula um, using a whole bunch of parameters uh, that we measure from the patient. And it tells us how well, it gives us a measure of how well we think their kidneys are working. So in someone with really good kidneys, it should be greater than 90. And then as it gets lower and lower, it means that the kidneys are functioning less well. Now, how do we actually measure how well someone's kidneys are working. Well the, well, the way we do it is we measure the waste products in the blood. So the job of the kidneys is to excrete waste products that the body produces that it puts into the blood. The kidneys take those waste products out and put them into the urine and then they're passed in the urine. So in people with bad kidney function, for whatever reason, and there's a whole bunch of things that can cause your kidney function to deteriorate. If you have high blood pressure for years and years and years, that damages your kidneys. If you have bad the controlled diabetes for years and years and years, that damages your kidneys. And then there are other more complicated things as well that damage your kidneys. So as your kidney function gets worse and worse, they get less good at removing these waste products from the blood and therefore the waste products level gradually goes up and up. Uh, so that's how we actually measure how well someone's kidneys are functioning. We measure the level of the waste products in their bloods. And then from that, we work out this thing called the EGFR, which is a simple number that tells us how roughly how well uh, their kidneys are actually working. So as I say, greater than 90 is fantastic. You've got no kidney problems at all. And then as it comes down, it gets worse. When you get below 30, that's where things start to get serious. We it's not good to have an EGFR less than 30. Between 15 and 30, we call that CKD4, standing for chronic kidney disease 4. And that's quite bad renal impairment. It's not disastrous, you know, it's not the level that you're going to require dialysis or a renal transplant, but it's, it's where we often end up having to change our... Uh, think more carefully about which drugs we're going to give you because of the fact that drugs are often excreted by the kidneys. And if your kidney function is very poor, then the drugs that we give you might stay in your body for much, much longer and have much more effect uh, and potentially accumulate to dangerous levels. So we start to worry about, we have to dose adjust often when people's EGFR is less than 30. When it's less than 15, that's really bad. That's when it's called CKD5. And then when it goes below sort of 10, that's where you're starting to get into the realms where people might need dialysis or a renal transplant if those are uh, appropriate options. So when people have CKD4 or worse, their EGFR is less than 30, we have to reduce the intravenous dose. So we no longer give it three times a day. We, we go down to giving it BD. So you can give 1.2 uh, 
and this is a incorrect here, it should be grams rather than milligrams, uh, intravenously twice daily. So I've corrected that. So to summarize dosing and then we'll move on, you can give oral or intravenous. If you give oral, the dose is 625 milligrams three times a day for however many days you want it to be. If you give intravenous, it's a higher dose. You give 1.2 grams, you still give it three times a day and then you continue for however many days you want it to go on for. If they have poor renal function, meaning that their EGFR is less than 30, then you can still give the same dose if you're giving oral augmentin. However, if you're giving intravenous, you should dose reduce to this dose or less. So 1.2 grams twice daily intravenous. Often people are a little bit more cautious and actually give half of this dose. So give 600 milligrams BD intravenously for people with uh, very low EGFRs. And the reason is that the clavulonate in augmentin accumulates in renal failure, so it's excreted renally, and in people with a poor renal function, it builds up in the blood to potentially dangerous levels. That's the reason that you need to dose reduce. So let's now talk about the side effects of augmentin. So I've mentioned the two main ones, the two scary ones already. Let me talk firstly actually about the most common side effect of augmentin that's reasonably trivial, or at least not as significant as the two that I've already mentioned, and then we'll talk about the two bad ones. So the most common side effect of augmentin is just diarrhea, especially if you give it orally, and it's because of the clavulonic acid. The clavulonic acid really does irritate the gut, especially when given orally, and then it increases gut motility due to the irritation, and therefore everything moves through the gut quicker, there's less time for the absorption of water, and therefore everything coming out is more watery, so you get diarrhea. So diarrhea is the main side effect of augmentin. Most people who take oral augmentin probably will get some degree of diarrhea from it. That does not mean that they have got a clostridial infection. It does not mean that they've got clostridial colitis. So diarrhea is a common side effect of augmentin separate from it causing this severe uh, colonic infection. Now let's talk about clostridial colitis. So the bug that causes this is Clostridium difficile. This normally lives in the colon in very small amounts. The problem when you give augmentin is that it kills off loads of the commensals in the colon but doesn't kill this bug. This bug then has lost all of its competition and its numbers increase massively and can increase to dangerous levels and it can start causing problems for the colon, it can start infecting the colon and that's when we say that you've got clostridial colitis. So this can happen when you take augmentin, it can happen when you take other antibiotics as well. There, in fact, there are ones that are worse for this. I've mentioned the cephalosporins, they're worse than augmentin for causing uh, clostridial colitis. Other ones that are really bad, it's actually tends to be antibiotics that begin with C, so it's the cephalosporins, then clindamycin is another dreadful one, even worse than augmentin, and then ciprofloxacin. So I've written them down here, so cephalosporins, clindamycin, and ciprofloxacin. Cephalosporins, as we've already discussed, are a whole class of antibiotics, examples being cephalexin, which can sometimes be used to treat UTIs if really necessary. Uh, keftriaxone, which is used to treat meningitis, bacterial meningitis, and keftazidine, which is an anti-pseudomonal antibiotic uh, used to treat pseudomonal exacerbations of CF, pseudomonal exacerbations of bronchiectasis. It's used in the cases where tazidin doesn't work. Sometimes they then try keftazidine as an alternative. Clindamycin is a single antibiotic. It's an antibiotic that we hardly ever use. We use it in severe cellulitis uh, and neck fash, which is a horrific form of cellulitis where the fat tissue starts to necrose. Uh, so really, really severe skin infections where uh, flucloxacillin isn't going to be enough. We add in clindamycin alongside flucloxacillin and that's like a really powerful combination to hit skin infections, flucloxacillin and clindamycin. And then ciprofloxacin is a fluoroquinolone antibiotic. It's used mainly in urology, so they use it to treat uh, prostatitis and epididymoorchitis. Anyway, these are the three terrible C's for C. diff infections. 
They're even worse than Augmentin. Augmentin is like underneath. Augmentin is another C if you call it coamoxiclav by its proper name. Um, so these antibiotics, they all kill off a whole bunch of the commensals, but they don't kill Clostridium difficile by themselves. And therefore the Clostridium difficile can overgrow and you can get Clostridial colitis. Now it is still a rare side effect of these antibiotics. If we go back to Augmentin, it is still a rare side effect. If you give Augmentin to 100 people, you can hope that none of them will get C. diff from it, but you might get a few in that 100 people who do get Clostridial colitis from it. So it's not vanishingly rare. In fact, if you gave it to 100 people, I would expect one or maybe more of them to unfortunately get Clostridial colitis from it. So that sort of like gives you an idea about how common it is. It's not something that's going to happen to every patient you give Augmentin to. You can give it to loads of people and hopefully none of them will get it, but eventually you will see uh, cases where you give them augmentin and they get uh, clostridial difficile infections from it. In particular, it's bad when you give it orally for obvious reasons, because if you give it orally, the antibiotics are all going through the GI tract. Some hopefully is being absorbed, but um, a lot of it is going and then being ex the GI tract is being exposed to it and therefore it's having a lot of effect on the GI tract. If you give it intravenously, it's less bad for causing diarrhea and it's less bad for causing uh, clostridial colitis because obviously you're injecting it into the vein and then much less of the drug is actually making it to the intestine compared to if you give it orally. So now just a little bit about this infection. So it is really awful. I've seen cases of clostridial colitis caused by um, Augmentin and other antibiotics. Uh, cephalexin is the nightmare one because some people end up on cephalexin long term as UTI prophylaxis and that is just asking for C. diff. They, yeah, it's an awful idea. Um, but it is a horrible GI infection. It's not it, the symptoms are similar to normal gastroenteritis. You get diarrhea and you get tummy pain. Um, but unlike normal gastroenteritis, it takes so long to get better. It usually takes weeks. Usually the symptoms are more severe. The tummy pains are usually worse than with, say, viral gastroenteritis. And it doesn't get better as quick. It takes usually people weeks to get better, especially if it's someone elderly and frail. It, the people end up getting C. diff and then they end up staying in hospital for weeks and weeks trying to actually clear that infection uh, because it is a bad uh, infection. Obviously, the first thing to do is to stop the antibiotic that has caused it, so to stop the Augmentin, um, and then hopefully it will self-resolve. If they need a bit of help getting it to resolve, we put them on antibiotics. There are a number of antibiotics that you can use to treat uh, C. diff. You can use metronidazole, that hits C. diff. You can use vancomycin, that hits C. diff. We give it orally. It's the only situation where we give oral vancomycin because vancomycin isn't well absorbed if you give it orally. So it's no use at all if you're trying to treat an infection that isn't in the GI tract. So C. diff is pretty much the only situation where you give oral vancomycin because there it doesn't matter that it's not going to be absorbed. You want it to stay in the GI tract. Uh, all other infections, say if we're using it to treat a chest infection or if we're using it to treat a skin infection, we want it to be given intravenously. So I've written these down here. So metronidazole, we can use that to treat uh, C. diff either orally or intravenously. Vancomycin, we classically use orally if we're treating a clostridial colitis. And then those are the main two antibiotics that we would use to treat C. diff infections. But there is this third one, fidaxomycin. This is really, really expensive. So it's usually used when we've had treatment failure with these two. So we've given these two antibiotics for good, long, decent courses. And the individual still has horrible abdominal pains, still has diarrhea. So we obviously have not beaten the clostridial infection, then uh, they're moved on to fidaxomycin. And I have seen people who haven't responded to metronidazole and vancomycin, they failed uh, together to clear this infection and therefore uh, they've gone on to fidaxomycin. The final thing to say about clostridial colitis is it's not just an unpleasant, drawn out infection, it's also dangerous. It can really, really damage the colon to dangerous levels. It can cause the colon to necrose, um, die, 
And if that happens, you know, it's going to make the person profoundly sick and they're most likely going to then die from that unless the colon is, the, the portion of the colon that has died is surgically removed. So it can be a really devastating, uh, fatal, surgical infection. So the risk of causing this by giving someone Augmentin is something that we do have to consider when we're prescribing it because this is not a trivial side effect at all and this is not a vanishingly rare side effect at all. As I say, most people will take Augmentin and will maybe get a bit of diarrhoea but it won't be clostridial diarrhoea. But there are those who are unlucky and will get this as a side effect from taking the Augmentin. Just a little bit further about clostridial infections. It is also actually a contagious infection. So someone who has got clostridial colitis at present, if they aren't great with their hand hygiene, they can end up with large amounts of clostridium difficile on their hands. And then if they maybe prepare a sandwich for someone else and then that other person eats the sandwich, that sandwich might be full of clostridium difficile that will then go into that person's uh, intestine and potentially set up an infection there. So it can be a transmissible infection.